All right, so the last part of this chapter on redox chemistry talks about batteries. We already covered batteries in lab a little bit, but batteries are pretty unique. They use electron transfer from redox reactions to do work. Basically, batteries act as this big potential energy storage. And typically, they're composed of half cells. There are some newer batteries that are a little bit different than this, but your classic battery is made up of two half cells like you saw in lab. So let's kind of review what we did in lab. All right, and in lab, we had two different metals. What were the two metal types that we had? Copper and zinc. Copper and zinc. So I'll put zinc on this side. And I'll say, all right, this was my zinc strip. And then over here, I'll put my copper strip. And we put each of these in their own separate beaker. So I'll just show it like that and like that. Got our <laughs> copper and zinc in there. And we filled each of these beakers with an electrolyte solution, right? And so what else am I missing here? Yeah, we need a salt bridge to help move electrolytes back and forth. So I'm going to show this salt bridge in blue. But you have to have something to help move electrolytes back and forth between half cells. We also had a multimeter in the top that was the thing telling us how much or what the voltage was for the system and then we had clamps going down to each of the metals right so it looks like we've got a lot going on here but in the zinc reaction we said that zinc as a solid really really wants to give up its electrons so what's going to happen in this half cell is zinc is going to form zinc 2 plus which will go into water, so we call that aqueous. And then it will generate two electrons. So to show this visually, what I like to do is show little zinc cations around in solution and then show an arrow basically saying, during this reaction, we're making more of the zinc cations. And during this reaction, you're generating electrons, specifically two of them, that are going up and over, right? So that makes sense. That's basically telling the story of half of our setup. All right. On the other side, what we have is copper 2 plus in solution. And in this reaction, we're taking copper 2 plus cations from solution. They're aqueous. We're going to combine them with the two electrons that came over. And we're going to be making copper metal. So during this reaction, the two electrons come over from that zinc side. The copper 2 plus cations in solution are going to get pulled out of solution and actually plate onto the copper metal and make that copper metal a little bit heavier. If you think about it during this reaction too, I'm going to just highlight this area over here. On the left hand side, we're putting more cations into solution, right? In order to bounce that out, we also need to find anions for them to partner with, right? You can't just have a cation, it always has to have its buddy. So in the salt bridge, what you're gonna do is move anions over. So I'm just gonna say, during this process, you're gonna shuttle an anion this way to cancel out the cations being formed. Does that make sense? And then on the opposite side, we're pulling cations out of solution that means we need to replace them somehow. So on this side, what we're going to do is pump cations over to replace any of the copper that was pulled out of solution. That's the whole purpose of the salt bridge. If we can't replace those cations or anions, the battery will just stop and you won't get any voltage. Does that make sense? So these are the two different half cells that we had for our battery. The zinc side, whoops, 
if we look at it, zinc is losing electrons, so is it getting oxidized or reduced? It's oxidized, right? So this is called the oxidation half cell. And the copper side is gaining electrons, so this is called a reduction half cell. Because it's gaining electrons from the zinc half cell. Normally when we talk about batteries, we don't talk about oxidation half cells and reduction half cells unless you're a scientist. Instead, we normally call them anodes and cathodes. Are you familiar with that when looking at batteries? All right, the anode is always going to be your oxidation half cell. And then your cathode is going to be your reduction half cell. Does anybody remember on a battery, is the cathode positive or negative? On batteries, you have the positive side, negative side. So the cathode is your positive side. And the simple thing I use to remember this is there's a T in cathode, and the plus kind of looks like a T. So it's a really simple trick you can use to remember, hey, the cathode always has a positive charge, right? Anode, on the other hand, is got to be negative. And sometimes people remember this. They say anode has an N in it. N is negative. You can also use that as a trick as well. So the cathode's always going to be a reduction half. So the other tr trick I used when I took Gen Chem was the red cat trick. A red cat basically allows you to remember that your reduction half cell is always going to be your cathode. So if you remember red cat, you can always remember reduction as cathode. Make sense? So is the copper being reduced as gaining electrons? Yeah. It's just the general trend that they use. Um, so if you think about where the electrons are going, right? The electrons are going towards the positive pole. So they're attracted to that positive pole. That's why they give it the positive charge. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it has more to do with that than the actual redox chemistry. It's a bit confusing, though. All right. So what do you think happens if we let this battery run for days and days and days and days? What will happen to the zinc anode? It's going to deplete. You're going to run out of zinc because all of the zinc is going to become zinc cations, right? So your zinc will eventually dissolve and you won't have any zinc left. And then if you think about the copper side, what will happen to that? It'll get coated and get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it doesn't have any more copper cations in solution to plate out. So that's what happens when a battery dies, is you're running out of this anode or cathode in order to um, transfer electrons. All right, I do have a little short video to show you a little bit of what's going on in the molecular level. So let me turn on the volume here. And I think this specifically relates to the battery we made. Hopefully this will work without crashing. Let's zoom into the atomic scale and see how this cell operates. Here, at the anode, the site of oxidation, zinc atoms in the metal bar are in contact with the surrounding electrolyte solution. Each atom loses two electrons and becomes a zinc ion, which diffuses into the solution. The electrons given up enter the bar and join the flow of electrons up toward the external circuit. They travel through the wire and flow into the cathode, the site of reduction. When a copper two ion in the cathode solution makes contact with a copper electrode, it gains two electrons and is reduced to a copper atom, which deposits on the bar. Therefore, as the cell runs, the zinc anode becomes lighter and the copper cathode heavier. Now let's close in to see the role of the salt bridge. 
The non-reactive sodium and nitrate ions of the salt bridge prevent the buildup of charge that would occur as zinc ions enter the anode solution and copper two ions leave the cathode solution. Such a charge buildup would halt cell operation. In the anode compartment, nitrate ions leave the salt bridge to balance the gain of positive charge as zinc ions enter the solution. Some zinc ions also enter the salt bridge. In the cathode compartment, sodium ions leave the salt bridge and nitrate ions enter it to balance the loss of positive charge as copper two ions leave the solution and are reduced at the cathode. All right, so that kind of visually shows you what's occurring at the molecular level, but I really like drawing these pictograms to kind of understand where things are going, and I like to include a lot of arrows to show the movement of cations and anions and electrons and so on. Yep? What's so specific about zinc that's occurring in the compound? Is it just because it's a transition metal, or is it something else special about zinc? So zinc isn't changing into a new element, it's just changing into a cat cation in this case, but I, I think I understand what you're asking. You're asking why is it giving up electrons? Right. Yeah, there's actually a huge set of physical properties for a bunch of metals showing redox potentials, basically saying how much do they want to give up electrons. And there are some elements that absolutely are not happy the way they are and they want to give up electrons. So a good example of that would be in group 1A. If we look at group 1A, those are all of the alkali metals, right? We said that alkali metals have a valence of 1. They're not happy having a valence of one. So they want to give up that electron really, really, really badly so that they have an octet. Does that mean they're going to be oxidized or reduced in the process? Yeah, if they're giving up that one electron, they're losing an electron, they're getting oxidized. Conversely, that makes alkali metals in group 1A really good reducing agents. So just knowing some of those basic physical properties can help you predict whether or not something will be um, an anode or a good cathode. So like, were they able to do this, make more copper from other things, like uh, algae? Is that what they're trying to do with gold? Like, what? why wouldn't you be able to do that with gold as well? So all they're doing here is not making new atoms. They're just taking something that was a cation and turning it into a metal, or vice versa, taking something that was a metal and turning it into a cation. The number of atoms doesn't change in the process. We're just moving electrons around. Yeah. All right, so if we take a look at these anodes and cathodes at the end. On the left, we've got our zinc. So zinc over here. And we said that it lost mass because a lot of that zinc became cation. So you can physically see it start to dissolve in solution. Over here, on the other hand, the copper gained mass because it was pulling copper cations out of solution, which are now plating on. If you notice in here, do you see how jaggedy that is? That's a serious problem with batteries, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes. I've got a cool video to show you. But does that make sense, kind of how to visually represent batteries? Let's do another one really quick. And I want you to help me kind of systematically draw this battery and we'll determine what's oxidized and reduced. So draw a battery representing this net reaction. All right, and the net reaction I have is using silver cations. This is aqueous, and we're going to mix this with zinc that's a solid. So zinc is a metal in this case. It's got to be one of our cathodes or anodes. And in this process, we're making silver solid plus zinc 2 plus aqueous. One thing I want to do before we get started, though, is to first determine what's oxidized and what's reduced and what's our oxidizing agent and what's our reducing agent. So let's just stop and determine that before we draw our battery. Yeah, it's AG, which is silver. 
Uh, the thing coming after it is AQ for aqueous. So once you think you know what's oxidized and what's reduced, let me know with the thumbs up. So what I'm going to do is just walk us through this. We know we're going from silver positive over here to neutral silver. So to me, it looks like each silver cation gained one electron. Make sense? All right. Now what we'd say is, well, is silver getting oxidized or reduced? Yeah, exactly. Silver is reduced. And I'm going to go ahead and highlight this just so we can keep track of this. All right, so now if we think about it, it's being reduced. Is silver going to be our cathode or our anode? Cathode, if you remember red cat, reduction always occurs at the cathode. So we know that silver in this case is going to be our cathode. I'm going to slide this down and make a little note too. So silver is our cathode. And like I said, the red cat analogy helps out a lot. All right, conversely, we can go ahead and take a look at zinc. Zinc up here was neutral. And then zinc over here is already given as two plus. So it looks like each zinc lost two electrons. That means that zinc is oxidized. I'm going to highlight this. Conversely, we know that this means that zinc must be our anode. All right, does that make sense? Kind of keeping track of it this way. So now what we need to do is we need to draw our battery to represent this overall net chemical equation. And so we know we've got a zinc metal and a silver metal. So let's go ahead and draw each of those and then we'll scroll up and look at this again. So I'll put zinc over here. It doesn't really matter which side you put them on. And just like before, we're gonna have each of these being two beakers. I'm gonna put a salt bridge across. Looks like that. I'm going to set up some wires with a meter here between each of those and fill them with electrolytes on both sides. What does an electrolyte solution mean again? Yeah, anything that has cations and anions and it can be considered an electrolyte. All right, so if we think about it, we go back up and we look at our equation. We said zinc lost two electrons. So if we go to our schematic, we can say, all right, if it's losing electrons, two electrons must be moving this way, and it must be going over to the silver side, right? And if we go back up and we look at our reaction again, we said zinc is going from solid, solid zinc on the left to zinc two plus on the right. So I'm gonna go down here and say, all right, zinc's going from solid to aqueous. So I'll say zinc, Two plus, so it's going from metal to solution. That means that the silver, on the other hand, is going from silver plus to solution, or to the solid, excuse me. All right, we already said that silver is our cathode. It's our reduction half cell. And what charge do cathodes have again? Positive. So that would be the positive pole. Over here, we know that this must be our anode. It's going to be our oxidation half cell.
and it's going to have the negative charge associated with it. All right, the other thing, too, that I want to go back to is our chemical equation. We've got a really good schematic drawn and a few more things to fill in. But if we go back up and we look at this, if you notice each zinc lost two electron, where each silver only gained one electron, we do need to bounce out the movement of electrons, and you can do that with reaction coefficients. So for example, if I say, all right, let's change silver to two on each side, it's still a bounced equation. We didn't change the bouncing of it, but now we're transferring two electrons from each set of atoms. Does that make sense? I'm not really going to push this very hard in this class, but it's something you might see later on, so I uh, present it just because of that. All right, so now if we go back down and we look at our battery, we've got this salt bridge. Now we've got to think about what's coming out of solution on this side. What should be pumped into that silver cathode solution? Cations or anions? Cations, to replace the silver that was lost. So cations will flow over this way. And then over here, we've got zinc coming out and forming zinc cations. We need to have a partner for those zinc cations. So anions will come out this side. Does that make sense? So this would be our overall representation for a zinc silver battery. There's a huge number of battery types out there. Who knows the most common battery type that's used in phones and whatnot? Lithium batteries. Those are a little bit different. So what I've got is a good video that relates this to the batteries you're more familiar with. And this may not be on our YouTube recording, but I'll post the video link because it is freely available. So I'm going to stop the recording right now.